the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have the story about the ten lepers today, how ten were healed, but only one was healed completely. And the story has much, much to think about in it. Uh, the calling of the Gentiles, about suffering, about gratitude, about obedience, about faith. All these things are in this little story. And it really dovetails well with the epistle to the Ephesians, this excerpt that we read today, because that epistle talks about faith and talks about being strong in the Lord. And uh, only one of these lepers was strong in the Lord. So let's look at the story in, in a little bit of detail. So as he entered into the certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers that stood afar off. They were outside the city because that's where they had to be. They weren't allowed to go inside the city. This leprosy, otherwise known by us now as Hansen's disease, caused by a bacteria that they didn't understand, caused massive suffering. It was very contagious. And until modern times, even, even uh, last century, the end of last century, it was a scourge to many people. In fact, really still, in some places in the world, there is leprosy where they're not medically well served. So they were outside the city because they were considered unclean. They were considered to be cursed by God because of this disease which causes uh, the flesh to be white and uh, the fingertips and the, the feet, the, the, the toes of the feet, the nose, the ears to fall off sometimes, disfigurement of the face, and uh, lots of pain and suffering and death. And they were afar off because they were obeying the law. Otherwise, they would have, they would have been killed probably. And they lifted up their voices and they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Well, what does that sound like to you? Of course, it sounds like the Jesus prayer. So these men were suffering greatly. And in their midst was a Samaritan. Nine of them were Jews. One was a Samaritan. Now, a Samaritan was a heretic, basically. And worse than a heretic, they had mixed. They were from peoples that the Jews should have destroyed when they went into the land of promise, but they didn't. <clears throat> and so they were people that mixed paganism and Jewish rites, and they had strange ideas about uh, the, the scriptures. They only accepted uh, certain books from the Pentateuch, etc. And they were considered to be terribly unclean, worse than a dog. And yet there was this dog with the other ones that the Jews considered to be dogs. So when there's great suffering, there's more empathy, there's more understanding. And with this great suffering, even these Jews, who were of a greater race than the Samaritans, had one in their midst that was of a foreign race, a stranger, a heretic. I think we can learn something from that very much because we're all lepers. <laughs> I remember reading an article by, I think he's now Bishop Tikhon, I believe, uh, who wrote Ordinary Saints. And uh, he wrote about a friend of his that he had, that had died. He missed him greatly. And for many, many days, for years, he would commemorate him among the dead in his personal diptychs. And then one day he realized that he had stopped doing it. And of course he started again, but he, he uh, took that as a lesson of how easy it is for us to forget, how easy it is for us to just lose track of, of things. And that we're all lepers. I believe it might have been the sermon that he was giving really on this, on this text. We're all lepers. So we're all suffering. Now, some people might be suffering in the church. Some people might be suffering outside of the church. Some people might be in the church, but living really a life that's not substantially different than those outside of the church. Some people might be having problems with drugs, alcohol, promiscuity, mental illness, whatever it is. We're all lepers. So we should not disdain anyone because we're all lepers. Now, thank God 
that we in the church, we have access to the great physician, the one who heals us. And no one is telling us that we are unclean and that we cannot come to the holy mysteries. So thank God for that. But there are many that don't know of the holy mysteries, don't know of God, that they have bizarre ideas about their identity and everything else, all this stuff that's happening in the world nowadays. They're all lepers. We're not better than them. We just happen to be in a better place than they are because we're in the household of God. So we're not better. In many ways, we're worse because what are we doing with this? Which one are we like? of those lepers? Are we like the nine or like the ten or like the other one? Are we the ones who give thanks to God who because of God healing us we continually ascend in virtue? Or are we just people who, well, I'm orthodox. I fast sometimes. I do this sometimes. Maybe I go to church sometimes. Well, that's not going to cut it. It's just not enough. If we know the goodness of God, we should be like that one leper who runs to God and gives thanks to him. We should be the one who dedicates our life to him. And we'll see that there's something about the dedication of our life to God after healing in this story. It's a little kind of hidden. It's kind of a little dark. But that's the way so much of the scripture is. It's so delicious. There's so much in it. And there's some phrases that seem common, but they're not common. Not if you understand them in a spiritual way. So, they say, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. How much do you pray? Jesus, Master, have mercy on me. Son, put that marble in your pocket. Okay? Put that marble in your pocket. Yeah, so it doesn't make noise. We should be saying the Jesus prayer. Everyone should be doing that. Everyone should be praying the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me. With prostrations, everybody should do that. If you can't do prostrations, then you do bows. But you probably can do a lot more prostrations than you think. And if you do one prostration and have to help yourself up by putting your hands on both sides of a bed or something, of two beds in between, uh, with space in between them, then do that. You have to use a chair. You have to use a cane. But you should pray the Jesus prayer because it's very powerful. The name of Jesus is above every other name. But it's only above every other name if it's above every other name in our heart. Now, of course, his name is above all names. God is God. But if we don't have God abiding in our heart, it does us no good whatsoever to know anything about God if he's not abiding in our heart, if we're not begging him for help and giving thanks to him for his great graces that he's given to us, that is giving him Self to us. That's what grace is. God giving himself to us, his energies to us. So you and I should be praying the Jesus prayer because we're lepers, because we have diseases, because we're like also paralytics or blind men. But God is taking the, the shingles off of our eyes and he's making our limbs strong and our flesh to be good and healthy. It's happening. It's happening slowly. But we are still lepers. We are still blind men. We're still paralytics. And everyone else among us is also a blind man and a leper and a paralytic. And we should have compassion on them, not consider ourselves to be better than them in any way. So when he saw them, he said unto them, go show yourself to the priests. Now that is a peculiar command because they were lepers. If they have leprosy, there's no reason to go to the priest. There is a reason to go to the priest. If the leprosy is cured, then they go to the priest. The priest examines them. There's an actual physical examination. Sees that they no longer have the signs of leprosy. And then they are, have to have some sacrifices. They're really quite complicated. And, uh, and offerings done. And then they are readmitted to the people. They're readmitted to the assembly. They can go to the synagogue. They can go to the temple. They can give sacrifice. They're now completely reinstated to their society. But these men had leprosy. So to go to the priest, if, he came, if they came close to the priest, the priest would notice the leprosy and say, get away, unclean. But they went. So 
Let's not make the mistake of saying that all of these nine lepers were men without any faith. No, they had faith. All ten had faith. They did something that really made not too much sense. Now, perhaps they were thinking, he's sending us to the priests. That must mean that we're going to be healed. But they still had to walk to the priest. And they weren't healed in the first step or the second or the third. Maybe the tenth or the thirtieth or the eightieth step, they were healed. So this is a great lesson for us. Your healing's coming. Maybe you don't always feel it. Maybe you don't always see it. But it's coming. It's happening right now. And God says, obey me. Do the right things. And indeed, you will be healed. That's what happened to these lepers. They obeyed God, even though the external evidence was not there. This reminds me of the blind man, the one born without eyes. And the Lord spits on the ground and makes a ball of mud and slaps it in his eyeball that's empty. And there's mud streaming down his cheeks. And he says, you go wash in the pool of Siloam. Well, why? You just put mud all over my face. And that's not going to help me. Well, he did. And of course, he was healed. And later on, he showed such great character, such beautiful character, when he was interrogated by those who saw the healing and hated Jesus because of it. So they went and they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. And he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, for he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? That's a good question. Are you not being cleansed? Which one are you? Are you the nine or are you the one? Perhaps we alternate. Some days maybe we might be the one. Perhaps we give thanks to God for something that we've been delivered from or are being delivered from. But perhaps on some days we're the nine. I think most often we're the nine, aren't we? We give very little attention to God. I just read something, a quote by St. John of Kronstadt, where he says, a man stands up before the icons and he recites a prayer that he knows by memory and he thinks that he has prayed. But it didn't enter into his heart. He didn't pray. You recite a prayer by memory and it, you're, it's not in your heart. You haven't prayed. You might as well read the phone book. Now, if you have inattention during prayer, this is not a reason not to pray. I have to put that caveat in there. Which one of us prays with full attention? But with effort, then God hears your prayer, even if there's not full attention. But if you're just rattling something off, if you're not paying any attention, well, then your, your prayer is not a prayer. In fact, your prayer might actually be really a blasphemy. So we have to pray with some attention. And we have to have a sense of that God is healing us. And we have to be the one leper. The one who says, God has healed me or is healing me. Glory be to God. I'm going to go back and fall at the feet of Jesus. There's prostrations right there. I'm going to fall at the feet of Jesus. And I'm going to say, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me. And I thank thee, O Lord, that thou hast helped me in, in this affliction of mine. So this is what this, this leper did, who technically shouldn't have even come to Jesus. Jesus was, of course, a Jew, and he's a Samaritan. He might be healed of his leprosy, but he's still a Samaritan. But because of love, because of gratitude, he went. And, of course, the Lord received him. That must have made the ruling elite grit their teeth and grind them because they saw him doing something out of pure love. We accept people out of pure love. We don't accept their, their faults. We don't accept their heresies. But we accept them. We love them. So we should never be speaking of people in a derogatory way, etc. We can speak the truth about things. I've stood up here and told you the truth about many things. In our society, there's insanity about the way people believe. There's insanity. There's insanity that people call Christianity something that is really paganism and demonism uh, and, uh, and uh, fornication and uncleanness, and they call these things Christianity. We should label those things as such. But the people that are immersed in those sins and those passions, we're right with them. Now, we don't have those sins and passions, but we're also lepers. 
So we're still being healed and they're being healed or perhaps not being healed yet. We should pray for their healing. So, what does the Lord says? The Lord says, There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said to them, Arise, or excuse me, and he said to him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. There is this little dark saying, Arise, go thy way. It sounds like he's just saying, Okay, you can, you're, you're dismissed, you can go to your home. You can go to the synagogue if you wish or the temple. You can go perhaps to see your wife if you have a wife. You can perhaps hug your children for the first time in 15 years. Arise, go thy way. But actually it means much more than that. The Lord is not dismissing him. The Lord is basically incorporating him into the army. (laughs) Arise, go thy way. Live now according to what's happened to you. That's the most critical thing. So he showed already that he had gratitude because of the healing. So now continue with that gratitude and mount up like an eagle and do more things. Pray and fast and and love your neighbor, love your enemy. Realize that you as a Samaritan, well, you're still a stranger. But soon after the resurrection, he wouldn't be a stranger anymore, would he? To the Jews, he would always be a stranger, but to Christians, he's not a stranger. He's one of us. He's one of the elect. So we have a responsibility when we are healed, as we are being healed, to arise and go our way. Not our own way. Go the way that God shows to us. Now, I said that the epistle kind of ties in there. And it it says things that, to me, are very mysterious. Maybe to you they're very simple and uh, obvious. I think they're very mysterious. Because I certainly understand what the sentence means, what the words mean. But I don't understand how to do it. So it's mysterious to me. It's mysterious to me, strength, power, faith. These things are mysterious to me. I participate in them. And thank God, more than I did when I was younger. But they're still mysterious. And I don't think any one of us should say, we are strong. Which one of us should say that? We have power. That we have faith. Well, we should say we have faith, but our faith is weak. We should say that we need help. Like the man who had the, the boy who was a, a demoniac. He had faith. Help my unbelief, right? I believe, help my unbelief. So he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. Then he has some symbolism and thing, put on the armor of God, etc., etc. And he reminds us that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. Please remember that when you hear a politician talk, there's powerful wickedness in high places. That's the, why these people lie more than they breathe. That's why our governments lie more than they govern, because of spiritual wickedness in high places. You don't fight this spiritual wickedness in high places only by political means or by some other means. You fight the spiritual wickedness in high places, these demons and these passions that are within you and within me by being strong in the Lord and, by, and in the power of his might. How are you strong? How do we become strong? Well, we become strong by living and going our way as the Lord commands us. But as the Lord heals us, then we get a little stronger. And then we, we use that strength and we become stronger yet. That's how we become strong in the Lord. To be strong in the Lord is to recognize that we are lepers and yet we are being cleansed. To be strong in the Lord is to recognize that everyone is our brother and our sister. Whether they are believers or even against God. Or even hate God. Because they all are made in the image of God. 
And God wants them all to obtain his likeness. To be strong in the Lord is to have love in your heart. To be strong in the Lord is to have zeal. To be strong in the Lord is to do your prostrations, to do your prayers, to emphasize spiritual things, to see things in a spiritual way and not in a, a uh, secular way. It's very difficult to be strong in the Lord. If you know anything about strength, you know that strength dissipates unless it is used. This has happened to me. Maybe I would lift weights for a while, and I'd be very strong. And then I hadn't done a, something for months and months and months. I go back. I can't lift the same amount of weight as I did before because my muscles have atrophied a little bit. So to be strong in the Lord is to keep being strong. And there's another thing that the apostle says to me is very mysterious, and very beautiful. But I think it's, it's, it's something that you should have basically as your watchword. This is the way we should be no matter what happens to us. And if you read the lives of the saints, you would have known that I would have mentioned them too, right? If you read the lives of the saints, you'll see that this, this capacity in them is happening all the time. So he says here, he says, Wherefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. That's what you and I are to do. We are to stand. No matter what's happening, we are to stand. We are to stand fast in the faith. That can be very difficult. You might stand and be trembling. You might stand and be fearful, but you're going to stand if you're going to be a Christian. That's what the martyrs did. That's what the confessors did. That's what everybody who has had God in their heart and cared about it, that it mattered to them, that's what everyone has done. You stand. Now, I've told you before, many times, and I will continue to tell you, things will not be easy. Things will be getting harder. Are you going to stand or are you going to fall? Well, if you're like that first leper, that one leper that Samaritan leper, you will stand. Because as you are being healed, God will be in your heart. You will feel God in your heart. And there will be nothing that matters to you except God. Not your land, not your children, not your family, not your health, not your very own life. If those things are in the way of standing, then you will be able to discard them. And I'm not saying you should discard your children or your family. But you... Perhaps you'll see your family die before your, before your eyes. If you read the lives of the saints, you'll see that happens. Or perhaps you'll see family fall away. But you can't fall away with them. You have to stand. Because who's to pray for them then if they've fallen away? Just you. So we are to stand in the Lord. And this standing is an active process. And the, this first leper shows us, this Samaritan leper shows us, this is the process. You give thanks to God. You recognize God working in your heart. Then you go to God and you give him praise and glory. And then you do what he tells you to do. Because he's going to say, okay, do you love me? Well, what did he tell Peter? Do you love me? Yea, Lord, I love thee. And what did he say? Well, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, take care of my flock. If you love me, do what I tell you to do. That's Christianity, to do what we're told. And what, what, what are we told? Well, we're told things in the gospel and the epistle and all of the scriptures. Also, just in, in the Holy Spirit telling us in our heart what we should be doing. You should be told these things all the time. You should hear these things all the time. If you're not hearing these things all the time, or uh, often, then there's something wrong. You better do more prostrations. You better do more confession. You better come to church a little bit more. That includes the vigil. And then you'll be able to be standing. You'll be a leper, but you'll be getting well. And your skin will be becoming warm and uh, healthy. And your heart will be healthy. It'll be a heart of flesh, not a heart of stone. And God will be in that heart of flesh, and all will be well if you stand. May God bless you and help you in all things. Amen.